Chapter 10 At the statewide gifted symposium each year, the gifted kids from 7th to 9th grade would get together for a four-week for a four week retreat, retreat to, as I always thought of it, hang out in the trees and pick one another's brains. Around the campfire they sang oratorios instead of folk songs. In the girls' showers they would swoon over the physique of Jax D'Amboise or the frontal lobe of John Kenneth Galbraith. But even the gifted had their cliques. There, there were the science nerds and the math brains. They formed the superior, if somewhat socially crippled, highest rung of the gifted ladder. Then came the history heads, who knew the birth and death dates of every historical figure anyone had ever heard of. They were passed by the other campers voicing cryptic, seemingly meaningless lifespans. 1769 to 1821. 1770 to 1831. When Lindsay passed the history heads, she would think the answers to herself. Napoleon. Hegel. There were also the masters of arcane knowledge. Everyone begrudged their, pres their presence among the gifteds. These were the kids that could break down an engine and build it back again. No diagrams or instructions needed. They understood things in a real, not theoretical way. They seemed not to care about the grades. Samuel was a master. His heroes were Richard Feynman and his brother, Howe. Hal had dropped out of high school and now ran the bike shop near the sinkhole, where he serviced everyone from Hell's Angels to the elderly who rode motorised scooters around the parking lots of their retirement homes. Hal smoked, lived at home with the heckler in, over the heckler's garage, and conducted a variety of romances in the back of his shop. When people asked Hal what, when he was going to grow up, he said never. Inspired by this, when the teachers asked Samuel what he wanted to be, he would say, I don't know, I just turned 14. Almost 15 now, Ruth Connors knew. Out of the aluminium tool shed behind her house, surrounded by the doorknobs and hardware her father had found in old houses slated for demolition, Ruth sat in the darkness and concentrated until she came away with a headache. She would run into the house, past the living room where her father sat reading, and up to her room, where in fits and bursts she would write her poetry. Being Susie, after death, in pieces, beside her now, and her favourite, the one she was most proud of and carried with her to the symposium, folded and refolded so often that the creases were close to cuts, the lip of the grave. Ruth had to be driven to the symposium because that morning, when the bus was leaving, she was still at home with an acute attack of gastritis. She was trying weird all-vegetable regimes, and the night before she had eaten a whole head of cabbage for dinner. Her mother refused to kowtow to the vegetarianism Ruth had taken up after my death. This is not Susie, for Christ's sake, her mother would say, plunking down an inch, thick sirloin, an inch thick sirloin in front of her daughter. Her father drove her first to the hospital at 3am and then to the symposium, stopping home on the way to pick up the bag her mother had packed and left at the end of their driveway. As the car pulled up, in, up into the camp, Ruth scanned the crowd of kids lining up for name tags. She spotted my sister among an all-male group of masters. Lindsay had avoided putting her last name on her name tag, choosing to draw a fish instead. She wasn't exactly lying that way, but she hoped to meet a few kids from the surrounding schools who didn't know the story of my death, or at least wouldn't connect her to it. All spring she'd worn the half a heart pendant while Samuel wore the other half. They were shy about their affection for each other. They did not hold hands in the hall what is at school, and they did not pass notes. They sat together at lunch. Samuel walked her home. On her 14th birthday, he bought her a cupcake with a candle in it. Other than that, they melted into the gender subdivided world of their peers. The following morning, Ruth was up early. Like Lindsay, Ruth was a floater at Gifted Camp. She didn't belong to any one group. She had gone on a nature walk and collected plants and flowers she needed help naming. When she didn't like the answers one of the science nerds provided, she decided to start naming the plants and flowers herself. She drew a picture of the leaf or blossom in her journal, and then what sex she thought it was, and then gave it a name like Jim for a simple leafed plant, and Pasha for a more downy flower. By the time Lindsay stumbled into the dining room, Ruth was in line for a second helping of eggs and sausage. She had made a big stink about no meat at home, and she had to hold, to hold to it, but no one at the symposium knew of the oath she'd sworn. Ruth hadn't talked to my sister since before my death, and then it was only to excuse herself in the hallway at school. 
but she'd seen Lindsay walking home with Samuel and seen her smile with him. She watched as my sister said yes to pancakes and no to everything else. She had tried to imagine herself being my sister as she had spent time imagining being me. As Lindsay walked by blindly to the next open spot in line, Ruth interceded. What's the fish for? Ruth asked, nodding her head towards my sister's name tag. Are you religious? Notice the direction of the fish, Lindsay said, wishing simultaneously that they had vanilla puddings for, at breakfast. They would go great with her pancakes. Ruth Connors, poet, Ruth said by way of introduction. Lindsay, Lindsay said. Salmon, right? Please don't, Lindsay said. And for a second, Ruth could feel the feeling a little more vividly, what it was like to claim me, how people looked at Lindsay and imagined a girl covered in blood. Even among the gifteds, who, who distinguished themselves by doing things differently, people paired off within the first few days. It was mostly pairs of boys or pairs of girls. Few serious relationships had begun by 14. But there was one exception that year, Lindsay and Samuel. K-I-S-S-I-N-G greeted them wherever they went, unchaperoned and with the heat of the summer. Something grew in them like weeds. It was lust. I'd never felt it so purely or seen it move so hotly into someone I knew. Someone whose gene pool I shared. They were careful and followed the rules. No counsellor could say he had flashed light under the denser shrubbery by the booze dorm and found Salmon and Heckler going at it. They set up little meetings outside and back of the cafeteria, or by a certain tree that they'd marked up high with their initials. They kissed. They wanted to do more but couldn't. Samuel wanted it to be special. He was aware that it should be perfect. Lindsay just wanted to get it over with, have it behind her so she could so she could achieve adulthood, transcend the time and the, uh, the place and the time. He thought of sex as the Star Trek transport. You vaporised and found yourself navigating toward another planet within the second or two it took to realign. They're going to do it, Ruth, Ruth wrote in her journal. I had pinned hopes on Ruth's writing everything down. She told her journal about me passing by her in the, car in the par parking lot, about how on that night I had touched her. Literally, she felt it, reached out. What I had looked like then, how she dreamed about me, how she had fashioned the idea that a spirit could be a sort of second skin for someone, a protective layer somehow. How maybe if she was assidu assiduous enough, she could free us both. I would read over her shoulder as she wrote down her thoughts and wonder if anyone might believe her one day. When she was imagining me, she felt better, less alone, more connected to something out there, to someone out there. She saw the cornfield in her dreams, and a new world opening, a world where maybe she could find a foothold too. You're a really great, you're a really good poet, Ruth, she imagined me saying, and her journal would release her into a daydream of being such a good poet that her words had the power to resurrect me. I could see back to an afternoon where Ruth warned, watched her teenage cousin undress to take a bath while Ruth sat on the bathroom rug, locked in the bathroom so her cousin could babysit her as she'd been told. Ruth had longed to touch her cousin's skin and hair, longed to be held. I wondered if this longing in a three-year-old had sparked what came at eight. That fuzzy feeling of difference, that her cr crushes on female teachers or her cousin were more real than other girls' crushes, has contained a, a desire beyond sweetness and attention. It fed a longing, beginning to flower green and yellow into a crocus-like lust, the soft petals opening into her awkward adolescence. It was not so much, she would write it in her journal, that she wanted to have sex with women, but that she wanted to disappear inside of them forever, to hide. The last week of the symposium was always spent developing a final project, which the various schools would present in competition on the night before the parents returned to pick the students up. The competition wasn't an announced until the Saturday breakfast of that final week, but the kids had already begun planning for it anyway. It was always a better mousetrap competition, and so the stakes were raised year after year, no one wanted to repeat a mousetrap that had already been built. Sammy went in search of the kid with kids with braces. He needed the tiny rubber bands orthodontist stole, doled out. They would work to keep the tension tight on the guiding arm of his mousetrap. Lindsay begged clean tinfoil from the retired army cook. Their trap involved reflecting light in order to confuse the mouse. What happens if they like the way they look? Lindsay asked Samuel. They can't see that clearly, Samuel said. He was stripping the paper off the wire twists from the camp garage 
garbage bag supply. If a kid looked strangely at ordinary objects around the camp, he or she was most likely thinking of how it would serve the ultimate mousetrap. They're pretty cute, Lindsay said one afternoon. Lindsay had spent the better part of the night before gathering field mice with stringlers putting them and putting them under the wire mesh of an empty rabbit hutch. Samuel watched them intently. I could be a vet, I guess, he said, but I don't think I'd like cutting them open. Do we have to kill them? Lindsay asked. It's a better mouse trap, not a better mouse death camp. Artie's contributing little coffins made out of balsa wood, Samuel said, laughing. That's sick. That's Artie. He supposedly had a crush on Susie, Lindsay said. I know. Does he talk about her? Lindsay took a long, thin stick and poked it through the mesh. He's asked about you, actually, Samuel said. What did you tell him? That you're okay. That you'll be okay. The mice kept running from the stick into the corner where they crawled on top of one another in a useless effort to flee. Let's build a mouse trap with a little ver little purple velvet couch in it and we can rig up a latch so that when they sit on the floor a door drops and little balls of cheese fall down. We can call it Wild Road and Kingdom. Samuel didn't press my sister like the adults did. He would talk in detail about mouse couch upholstery instead. By that summer, I had begun to spend less time watching from the gazebo because I could still see Earth as I walked the fields of heaven. The night would come and the javelin throwers and shot putters would leave for other heavens. Heavens where a girl like me didn't fit in. Were they horrific, these other heavens? Worse than feeling so solitary among one's living, growing peers? Or were they the stuff I dreamed about, where you could be caught in a Norman Rockwall world forever? turkey constantly being brought to a table full of family, a wry and twinkling relative carving up the bird. If I walked too far and wandered loud enough, th en enough, the fields would change. I could look down and see horse corn and I could hear it then, singing, a kind of low humming and moaning warning me back from the edge. My head would throb and the sky would darken and it would be that night again, that perpetual yesterday lived again my soul solidifying, growing heavy. I came up to the lip of my grave this way many times, but had yet to stare in. I did begin to wonder what the word heaven meant. I thought, if this were heaven, truly heaven, it would be where my grandparents lived, where my father's father, my favorite of them all, would lift me up and dance with me. I would feel only joy and have no memory, no cornfield and no grave. You can have that, Granny said to me. Plenty of people do. How do you make the switch? I asked. It's not as easy as you might think, she said. You have to stop desiring certain answers. I don't get it. If you stop asking why you were killed instead of someone else, stop investi investigating the vacuum left by a loss, stop wondering what everyone left on Earth is feeling, she said. You can be free. Simply put, you have to give up on Earth. This seemed impossible to me. Ruth crept into Lindsay's dorm that night. I had a dream about her, she whispered to my sister. Lindsay blinked sleepily at her. Susie, she asked. I'm sorry about the incident in the dining hall, Ruth said. Lindsay was on the bottom of a three-tiered aluminium bunk bed. Her neighbour directly above her stared. Can I get into bed with you? Ruth asked. Lindsay nodded. Ruth called in next to Lindsay in the narrow sliver of the bed. What happened in your dream? Lindsay whispered. Ruth told her, turning her face so that Lindsay's eyes could make out the silhouette of Ruth's nose and lips and forehead. I was inside the earth, Ruth said, and Susie walked over me in the cornfield. I could feel her walking over me. I called out to her, but my mouth filled with dirt. She couldn't hear me no matter how much I tried to yell. Then I woke up. I don't dream about her, Lindsay said. I have nightmares about rats nibbling at the ends of my hair. Ruth liked the comfort she felt next to my sister, the heat their bodies created. Are you in love with Samuel? Yes. Do you miss Susie? Because it was dark, because Ruth, Ruth was facing away from her, because Ruth was almost a stranger, Lindsay said what she felt. More than anyone will ever know.